pleasure to debate Carlo. Um, it will be better with an Antinori wine, maybe, but we, we're here to discuss this issue. And there is no question that FFR is probably the most important issue we have for treatment in chronic stable angina. Previous to FFR, or to the data of FAME2, the five-year follow-up shown in this slide, we had these arguments that chronic stable angina treated with percutaneous interventions will not improve heart outcomes. Now we know that because we select the patient properly, we dev devoted proper treatment for the right patient, we reduce myocardial infarction. So, Courage, Barry 2D, they had a selection bias and they implanted devices and did interventions in patients that didn't need it. Now we have FFR, so no questions asked. It's good to move forward. However, as much as FFR is optimal to select the patient, if you see this curve here, the PCI Periprocedural PCI will have more events independent of FFR. So, no questions asked. FFR guided PCI will identify the patients, but it will not help you to improve the outcomes once you decide to do the PCI. This is the key. So, after selecting the correct patient with the FFR, how we can improve our outcomes during PCI? And this is an efficacy issue. When, this is important. Now, is there any randomized data that is sounded? Well, we have the IVUS XPL randomized clinical trial, 1,400 patients, and look at the data. There is a 60, I'm sorry, 52% reduction in events mostly related to target-driven revascularization, a 50% reduction. Half of the patients require further interventions if you do a right job and if you look at what you do. Now, why it's been so for so many years, why we have these arguments? Because the data out there was with trials that were very small. They were not powered to identify clinical, hard clinical endpoints. If you actually do the meta-analysis, you can see that you reduce death, you reduce re revascularization, TVR, maze, and stent thrombosis significantly. And why? Well, because you do a better job. You realize you didn't do a perfect job, and you go back and you optimize what you did, and you increase the stent size. You increase your uh, minimal luminal area. So this is key. Now, how is the field going to evolve? We go from angiography guided to IVOS guided and to OCT guided, and this is what our friend uh, Siad Ali has done, showing in the Illuminal trials that OCT results in comparable minimal stain area when compared to IVUS, but it's better than angiography, and it's superior to IVUS to identify these predictors of major adverse events. So what is these predictors of, are they demographic? Are these risk factors? No, these predictors are induced by us. They are induced by the intervention, and it comes with, the, with this interesting definition of uh, Dr. Prati, who says, what is this suboptimal stent implantation I'm going to show you? It is the presence of big dissections, 200 microns in width. It is the presence of malaposition, 200 microns from the stroke to the vessel wall. It is stenting areas, in, and in your reference minimal luminal area, you actually landed the stent on, on a plaque, and you have less than 4.5 millimeter in the minimal luminal area in the proximal or distal reference. It is also the, the problem of not expanding the stem properly and leaving less than 4.5 millimeter or less than 70% to, compared to the reference diameter. And is also identifying plaque protrusions or actually thrombuses greater than 0.5 millimeters. We're not talking here about some haziness, little things, twiggy stuff. We're talking here about issues that we can improve if we actually look for it. Now, let's see what is the incidence of this. Let's vote. Is it is less than 10%, 10 to 20, 20 to 30? Is this very rare? Is this frequent or is this very frequent? 
The answer is 30 to 40% of the, of the cases, if you actually look, you will have these issues in suboptimal stent deployment. So, what is the clinical relevance of this suboptimal stent deployment? Uh, they really affect the outcomes. The trial is still to come, but retrospective and solid data shows that if you have these issues that we discuss, the distal edge dissections, the proximal reference narrowing, the incidence of this is significantly increased when you have maize when compared to you didn't have maize. Interestingly enough, the thrombus and the tissue prolapse was not significantly different. But look at the importance of this suboptimal deployment in clinical uh, factors. Now, is there any data suggesting that correcting these predictors will improve clinical events? So now prospectively, let's, let's do this prospectively. And the, the issue is we need a randomized OCT-guided PCI trial, and it's coming, but we have data from the people in France uh, who randomized 240 patients and use FFR. Because remember, if you have less than 0.92, your outcomes are not that great post-PCI. And if you have more than 0.92, your outcomes are good. And here enough, if you do OCT-guided PCI, you have a much better outcome by FFR, physiologically speaking, post-PCI. Look at the, at the quartile that had less than 0.9. You had the majority of them were angiographic-guided PCI compared to the OCT, and look at the highest quartile with 0.96 to 1 FFR post PCI, the majority were OCT guided PCI. So the key here is that we can improve what we do. But out of curiosity, what was the incidence of suboptimal stent implantation in this trial? You can see. You know, we have more time, more fluoroscopy time, and more contrast media in the OCT-guided PCI. However, the under-expansion, 42%, malaposition, 32%, incomplete coverage, 20%, dissection, 37%. This led to more overdilation in 43% of the, of the patients with better, lower residual stenosis. So in conclusion, for this trial, OCT-guided PCI improves FFR post-DES. What we really need is what Siad is doing in, in his co collaboration uh, and worldwide, that OCT-guided PCI versus angio-guided PCI in complex vessels will actually show better outcomes. So we can use the seven step, identify morphology for calcification, length diameter, placement of co-registration, edge detection, apposition, and gain expansion. So in summary, we should use FFR to select the correct patient before PCI. How can we improve of PCI? We have option one, don't look, don't act. You will have this. Or option two, looked and act. Thank you very much. <laughs>